Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Flying Goat Farm podcast with me, Lisa Check. Today, we're going to be talking about spinning tips and tricks. It's season two, and it's episode 13. And so here's what's happening on the farm. Um, it's been crazy, crazy hot here um, for the past, I want to say, two weeks. Today, it is cool-ish. It's overcast. We got a big down big downpours yesterday, which helped to cool it off. Um, it may do a little raining this afternoon. I'm not exactly sure. I didn't watch the weather this morning. But we are knee deep in harvest season. Um, I think I told you in the last podcast that um, our hay field was cut, which was awesome to get that off the, off the board, so to say. And um, Bill has been harvesting tomatoes and green beans and radishes. What do you do when you have a, an entire row of radishes and only two people to eat them? Well, I found one of my favorite um, canning books is called Preserving by the Pint. And in there they had a recipe, basically it's a technique, not really a recipe, for doing some fermented pickles with radishes. So I actually made two big half gallon jars of these fermented radish pickles. And if you like sauerkraut and you like radishes, you'll like this. It has the radish flavor, but it doesn't have that stinging bite that sometimes radishes have. And it takes, tastes a little bit like sauerkraut. We harvested plums and we did some of our peaches as well. And, um, so we're just kind of waiting for the rest of the vegetables. Oh yeah, there's a ton of zucchini out there too. So that's what is happening around here. Just kind of harvesting, putting stuff up for the winter time and trying to deal with, you know, all the stuff, that, the bounty that we have and um, not drowning in it either, <laughs> which, you can, which you can do. It's, you know, sometimes doing these little, you know, gardening uh, vegetables. It can be feast or famine. Sometimes, like last year, we got hardly any tomatoes. This year, we're going to have um, a lot because Bill's been hydroponically um, starting them, and so they're they're fantastic bushes. So that's what's happening. So let's dive into our tips and tricks for spinning. Um, just to recap the Tour de Fleece, by the time you hear this, it's going to be over. Um, but right now, um, today, I'm recording this on Sunday, the uh, 18th, and it is the last day of the Tour de France. And so, therefore, the last day of Tour de Fleece. Um, I am excited that I met my goal, which was to... Um, spin up 1,200 two-ply yards. And so in essence, I spun 3,600 yards. Um, 3,600 yards went through the orifice of my spinning wheel. Um, and I'm not sure, I may have to do a little bit more um, just depending on the pattern that I ultimately pick. But um, I, I'm glad that I met the goal that I set out to do. And along the way, it has made me think about all the different tips and tricks that I use that has made my life as a spinner uh, more easy. Um, so tip number one is preparing for your spinning. This is really true when you are gonna do applied um, yarn. And whether you're spinning a braid or if you're spinning an entire fleece, what I like to do is divide up the spinning into portions that will easily fit on your bobbin. I have regular size Ashford bobbins. Um, they will comfortably fit two ounces of um, yarn on them. So uh, I can take, I take paper bags and uh, you only really need two. Um, and I weigh out and portion out two ounces in each of the bags. Now, the, the point of this is that, you know, in, in a perfect world, you will then not have any yarn left over on in either one of those bobbins. 
in the real world, that has never happened to me. There's always going to be one bobbin that's going to be just a little bit longer. Um, that's just the way it is, whether that's just a difference in the way in my spinning. Um, some, you know, maybe one, one bobbin is a little bit thicker than the other one. So there's more like yardage on the thinner one, or maybe it's a difference in um, weighing it out. That maybe some micro uh, differences that isn't picked up by my scale. Um, but either way, I, I usually end up with one still that is a little bit longer, but that's okay. For this tour, um, that was my goal was to, to do these two ounce portions and then, um, then, then to ply those up. Um, I found that I couldn't do that comfortably. So, you know, the, the, and this isn't one of my regular tips, but I'm just going to say this. It's time for self-compassion, people. I just knew I couldn't sit and spin for the entire two ounces. So I went down to one ounce portions, which worked out really great because I did one ounce portions on two bobbins for my singles. And then I had two ounces that would go onto my bobbin. So I only had to, I could fill one bobbin comfortably with those two one ounce portions. So I'm really glad that I went down, but the, the, the primary reason was, is I can't sit for that long. Number one, I have too many things to do. And number two, it just is a little bit of a strain um, on my back. And so I decided to show myself compassion and go down in the number of ounces I was doing. And you know what? I still met my goal. So that's still awesome. So prepare yourself for spinning, especially if it's a ply. If you were doing a three ply, you could have three bags right? So just think about that. Okay, tip number two to pre-draft or not pre-draft. This is highly con controversial because pre-drafting is seen as such an amateur move. But I'm here to tell you I beg to differ. Um, when I sit at the wheel, I want my spinning to go smoothly. I want to be in the flow. I want it to be um, a relaxation exercise, I don't want to be stressed out about it. So I always, always, always pre-draft. And I will say it is especially important to pre-draft if you are a beginning spinner and you don't have a lot of experience with um, how the fibers will slide against themselves. So by pre-drafting, you, you learn about what it's going to take to make the yarn that you want. It's also really important if you're using a new kind of fleece, a new kind of roving, uh, maybe a blended roving you ha haven't used before, and, um, and if you're using a new dyer's work. Um, if the dyeing hasn't been done totally, totally correctly, if the heat's been a little bit too high, um, the roving can be slightly felted. And so the pre-drafting will help you get through those sections and um, make it just such a, an easier, nicer uh, spin for you. So ignore all the haters and the judgmental people and pre-draft to your heart's content. Tip number three, when should I oil my wheel? And as a disclaimer, I need to remember to do this more often. Um, usually, in all truthfulness, I only oil my spinning wheel when it starts to squeak. But in a perfect world, every time that you switch out your bobbin, you should oil. This is a this is a tool, and most of these tools are pretty expensive, and so you really want to take care and be kind to your machine. Um, and it's really important to do this um, when the seasons change. Um, here, the winters are very dry, the summers are very wet, um, and the opposite would be true in other parts of the country. And so when the seasons change, you really do need to oil just to be kind to your machine. 
and at least once a year you should um, feed the wood. Um, I made a terrible mistake when I purchased my Ashford Traveler, which is my go-to wheel, in that I did not buy one that was finished. I bought an unfinished one, thinking that I would lovingly oil it every week until it got just that beautiful, um, nice finish, a Danish oil wood finish. And I haven't done that. Um, so, but now it's like at least once a year, maybe every six months, maybe when the seasons change, you should get out some of your um, wood oil and um, treat your, your, uh, your wheel to a spa day. It will thank you for it. Tip number four, how to spin a commercial yarn. Um, so this is something that I just took a class about and all of and it really made sense to me and I wanted to pass this along. So if you're gonna be using a commercial pattern, the, the designers of course are using a commercial yarn. So if you wanna use your hand spun for that, then you have to try to um, emulate that commercial yarn. So the first thing to do, of course, is to look at what the standard weight is. Is it a DK? Is it a sport? Is it a fingering? And then you, can do, you need to do a little bit of math as well and to take the number of yards or meters um, and that's in one ball or skein that's listed on that pattern and divide it by the weight of that ball. So let's say it was um, 400 yards in a four ounce ball. That means you're going to get about um, 1600 yards or so per pound. It gives you the yards per pound. And that's something that is easy to measure with um, a yarn balance when you are trying to emulate the yarn. Okay, so then you're gonna start spinning up some samples and um, making the ply that you want, trying to hit the standard weight so that it looks like fingering or looks like DK or looks like worsted. And then with your yarn balance, you are going to find out what the yards per pound is of your yarn. And that will help to let you see if you're getting close to what the commercial yarn is. Um, and then you can make any adjustments. Is it too many yards per pound? Do you, can you go a little thicker? Um, that kind of thing. And then after you make those adjustments and come up with the yarn that you think is going to work, then you need to do a gauge swatch. Yes, you need to do a gauge swatch. I'm going to say it again. You need to do a gauge swatch. And then you can compare those stitches per inch in the pattern to the stitches per inch that you get and either uh, increase the size of your needle or decrease the size of your needle to more accurately reach the target gauge swatch or the gauge uh, measurements. Um, this is especially point, important if this is a, something that is going, you're going to wear because if your gauge is off on a worn garment like a sweater um, or socks, that, that it's going to affect the size of the whole um, garment that you're making. So it's worth the time. It's worth the effort. It's worth buying more of the roving so that you have enough to be able to make that those gauge swatches that you might need. And then please, please, please document what you have done. Um, it's especially if you're doing something like I decided to do for this Tour de Fleece where I'm spinning up 1,200 to 1,600 yards. Um, I'm, you're going to be spinning for a lot of days. And the, the days that you spin, like me, they, during the Tour de Fleece, I'm spinning on consecutive days. But if this is the real world, I'm probably only spinning once a month at, when I have a crafter noon get together. So um, I need to have something visual that I can see what I was doing and I can compare what I'm spinning today with, it, with what I was um, spinning the rest of those days. Um, sorry about the bleeps. <laughs> 
we're just going to go past that. Um, so then when you reach the yarn that you want and you have made all those adjustments, pull some of it of the singles off and you're going to put it on a card. So I make a sl two slits into, and I just use a regular index card. And then I also make a hole. And um, on the card, I'm going to write down the type of fiber, the source. You can write the cost on it. If there's a colorway name, maybe you write that on it. Um, and um, you can even put a little piece of the roving or top onto your card as well. And then with that, then I wrap the singles around using the, the, um, the slits as my stopping points. And in the hole, I put a plyback sample so that this is the yarn that I am trying to make. So this is what the singles looks like. And this is what the plyback looks like. And then every time I sit at my wheel to spin, I can review that card and make sure that that's what I'm spinning today. Also on that card, this what I ended up doing was each time that I um, that I applied and skeined off my plying, I had a number of yards that was um, on my skein winder. So I put that those calculations um, onto this card as well, so that I knew okay, I've got you know each I've got. Uh, six balls now and each ball is about 200 um, yards in each so now i know i have 1200 yards so it's just good to keep that documentation um, and i also stapled this card inside with the pattern that i'm using so all of it is all together in one place it makes it pretty nice all right so tip number five is ply alternatives. Um, the first one I want to talk about is chain plying. Um, so if you um, are spinning on a spindle, a drop spindle, or if you have those bits of yarn that are left over after you've plied up from two bobbins and you just have some left over and you're done with that braid and you just want to get that done, um, then you can use these different ply alternatives. So what, the first one is a chain ply. With this, a chain ply is going to give you a three ply yarn. And it's like making a big crochet chain, single chain in crochet. This is the only thing I know how to do in crochet is to do a single chain. Um, when you start, you have to make a loop. So usually when I start, I have to start with a knot. I can't figure out another way to do it, so that's the way I do it. And then I go through that loop and pull the single through the loop. And then that, what I'm pulling through, will become a loop as well. And so you just keep doing that, pulling the single through the current loop and all the way down the line as if you were making a single chain on a crochet. I have a video for this. And in the show notes, you will have... Uh, you will see links to that. The other way to do it, if you don't want a three ply, you want to keep with the two ply, is to ply from the inside and outside of a ball. So in that case, what you need to do is that you take your singles that you have left and you um, cake them up on a ball winder. And then the, with the ball winder, you have an end that's coming from the inside of the ball and an end that's coming from the outside of the ball. Um, I end up putting fingers inside of my ball to keep the inside so that the inside stays open. Um, and then I can use those two plies to also make um, a two plied yarn. Um, that one I don't have a video yet, but there will be a video to show the different hand movements that you can do. Again, when it's up and running, it will be in the show notes. All right, skeining up your hand spun, putting it on a nitty knotty or some kind of um, skein winder. Um, the tip here is put a lot of distance between yourself or wherever you are 
making your skein and your bobbin where your either singles or plied yarn is. When you have a lot of space between you and that bobbin, that twist will has more chance to even out. So the distance, a greater distance evens out the, the um, any inconsistencies in your ply twist, it will even that out. That's a fun one. You can see that happen right away. Tip number eight on setting your twist and finishing your yarn. Um, so it's when I learned how to set my twist, I was told to use hot water um, and soap. Um, I'm here to tell you if you're using a hand dyed skein or hand dyed roving, hand dyed top, do not do that. Use cool water. Um, the acid dyes that are used on wool, um, they have very, very weak bonds and hot water will disrupt those and you'll get and you'll get dye runoff with hot water. So use cool water to set your twist. Squeeze out your skein. And then there are two ways to, again, even out more of the twist that you might have. One is to slap it against a wall. So hold, hold your skein in one hand and then slap that skein against a wall. Or I have columns in front of my studio that I can slap it against. And you do this a few times, you whack it a few times and it does even out the twist. Um, the other thing that you could do is like you hold on to one end of it and you do like a windmill with one of your arms and do that really fast. And the third way is to snap the skein. So holding it on two sides and snap it a few times, jerk it and again to set that twist and then just leave it to dry. Um, I do not put weights on my skeins when I have them dry. I like to have the elasticity left in my skeins and if you put a weight on it, it's going to um, set the yarn where there isn't any elasticity left. So I don't use weights. I just hang it out outside or in the shower or someplace where it can drip if it's that wet still. Tip number nine. Okay, redo. Sometimes you feel like you just didn't get the yarn that you wanted. You don't like the look of it. Um, this happened to me. I got a new e-spinner. It has a different kind of tension on it that I'm not used to. And um, I the it seemed to me that every time that I put the yarn onto the bobbin, somehow that the, the motion that I use all the time is helping to unspin my yarn. So the, the applied yarn that I was getting was very, very underspun. But it could, this could also happen is that maybe you just put in too much twist. Um, and it just is way overspun and you don't like that look either. So you can run it back through your spinning wheel to get the yarn that you want. Um, what I do is I put it, uh, I put the skein of the yarn that I'm going to redo. I put it on um, a swift and so that I can then pull it through. I don't put it into a ball. I don't put it back on the bob and I just use this a swift for that. Um, and depending on which side you grab first, you, you are going to have to figure out which way you're going to operate your machine. Um, so if I'm going to be adding twist, I need to go in the same direction as the original twist. I just want to add a few, a little bit more twist. But if I picked up uh, the, um, the end that was twisted last, I might have to go in this in the S direction, or if I picked up the original one, which I, there's no way of knowing which one that is at this point, um, I will might have to go in the Z direction. So at that beginning, you need to figure out which way you're going to work your wheel, whether you're going to be adding twist or, or subtracting twist. 
So if you're adding twists, you're going to twist in the same way that you twisted before. And if you're removing twist, you're going to go in the opposite direction of your first twist to untwist it a little bit more. Um, again, you're going to run it through really fast because it probably doesn't need a whole lot of extra twisting or untwisting. It just needs a little bit. So you're going to be going pretty quickly, um, getting that, you know, making sure that you're... Um, that your tension is high enough so it's pulling it into onto the bobbin quickly so that it, now it doesn't get too over twisted. And at the end of that, you need to re you need to reset your twist. Um, so go ahead and go through the motions again of getting it wet, of slapping it or jerking it and hanging it to dry. And this works, it really works. So those are my tips for spinning, my tips and tricks. Um, if you are a visual learner, um, like I am, um, I will have all of these tips and tricks up on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, and so on the podcast page, there will be links that you can go to to find all of these tips and tricks so that you can see them and um, try them yourselves. So what's next now that Tour de Fleece is over. Well, never, never fear, because this year we've got another great sporting event starting on Friday. We have the Olympics. And so in years past, um, Ravelry has had groups that posted Rav Hellenics. Some of the groups are just calling it Hellenics this year. Um, and this is an, is an event for all crafters, not just spinners. Um, and the purpose is to craft every day of the Olympics. Some people make it a goal to start and finish an entire project in that two weeks, and others just have the goal to craft every day. So if you want to join us, I will be putting up threads each day on my Flying Goat Farm yarn page on Facebook so that you can post your pictures, you can tell us your updates, you can show us what you're working on. It's really fun to see what everybody else is doing and to get inspiration and it's great to be part of a community that again that will start on friday friday morning here on the east coast they are showing the opening ceremonies and i will be casting on my next fiber shed sweater the from the yarn that i just completed with the tour de fleece so i'm really looking forward to that so i hope that um, you can join us and make it a really great community event for two weeks. So until I see you again in person or virtually or here on the podcast, happy making.